Hi, right, Guy. How are you? I'm fine, George. How are you today? Thank you. So thank you for uh, uh, for giving us uh, your time uh, to accept our invitation to participate in the uh, Training Masters series. And uh, we're so glad to have you on. Thank you. And so uh, I'll ask you, so it is a very good opportunity. Uh, I've been waiting for this time for, for, uh, for some time, since actually since uh, early April, <laughs> because uh, early April you interviewed me for uh, one and a half hours and uh and and i this actually this training master series is uh is is partially is because of inspired by your interviewing event and your hpd series and all that so i'll come back to that but before that uh can you tell us a little bit about yourself for your audience for our audience that uh, please introduce yourself where you grew up and where you went to college and what you what you studied was your major and uh where are you now Yes, my name is Guy Wallace. I uh, was born and raised in the south suburbs of Chicago, Illinois. And I spent uh, my first uh, 16, 17 years in that area, including uh, Northwestern Indiana, and then back to the south suburbs on the Illinois side of the border. Um, I moved away when I was 17 years old uh, to the Kansas City area and I lived in the suburbs of Kansas City on the Kansas side. Uh, and uh, then I went to college at the University of Kansas. And I had a false start and I started in architecture. And then after the first semester, I, I, with, uh, with help from my guidance counselor, I changed majors. And I started pursuing a radio TV film degree. I. Uh, uh, ran out of money after my third semester. I was putting myself through college and I uh, dropped out of college to go to work and then I got drafted at the end of the Vietnam War and I served three years in the Navy. My father insisted I join the Navy instead of going into the Army and in the Navy I was a journalist on board a helicopter carrier uh, and I was, uh, I had gone to school for print journalism and broadcast journalism. And my job on my ship was to run a closed circuit television system to entertain 600 sailors and 2,400 Marines. And then I left the Navy and went back to the University of Kansas and I got my degree in radio TV film. And I was working part-time for the last two and a half years at college for a company that hired me to go to their headquarters and join their training organization. And they were converting from 35 millimeter slides and audio tracks to video. And so my radio TV film degree got me that job. And I went to work uh, uh, with them and I worked alongside of uh, uh, Gary Rumler's brother-in-law. And I worked with two people who had worked with Gary Rumler's brother so I was immediately influenced by uh, people like that. So nowadays I'm, uh, I'm, I'm in the Western uh, North Carolina area, the, blue, the beautiful Blue Ridge Mountains, and I'm uh, semi-retired. I, I still do work, um, but I, I'm, I'm not uh, actively pursuing work, but I've gotten a few projects since I've kind of uh, semi-retired and uh, so I'm, I'm just enjoying life. Uh, I live close to my uh, wife's children and uh, we have four grandchildren there in the area and we enjoy seeing them when we can, but you know, nowadays that's a little bit tough, social distancing and all. So how many years uh, did you serve in the army in total? Well, in the Navy. So I served three years Navy. in the Navy. Yeah, um, the Navy. Yeah. And, uh, so what, uh, uh, when did you start to, you know, get, you know, to engage yourself into performance improvement and uh, what's the occasion? Uh, so I started, I was, it, it began immediately right out of college. My, and this was in August, 1979. So I've been in the business for 41 years or thereabouts. And uh, I was given a couple of things to read on day one. And one of those things was uh, an early version of this, 
This is Bob Mager, the late Bob Mager. He just passed away a, a couple of weeks ago, a month ago. Yeah. And yep. Peter Pipe's book, Analyzing Performance Problems. And I, they gave me this book and said, this is what we're going to do. So read this. So I spent the first evening at home. Uh, I was living in a motel because I hadn't really moved there yet. But I, I read this and I was so excited that the next day I ordered four copies of this and sent them to my best friends in college who wrote me back and said, basically, you know, what the heck is this all about? But I was so excited because this was, I knew I was going into the training function. I had desires of being involved in educational TV with my radio TV film degree, but I didn't go that route, but I ended up in a training organization. So that was close enough for me. And then I got really excited because we were going to um, be focused on performance. And when, what I learned from this is that oftentimes problems are not going to be solved by training, which was a huge eye opener for me. And I was very excited about that. Um, and so our first, and, and another thing that they gave me on that first day was a newsletter article from 1970, the Praxis newsletter. And Praxis was an organization that was uh, founded by uh, Tom Gilbert and Gary Rumler. And so again, it was another Rumler connection. And that article talked about guidance. And in the 60s and 70s, they were calling it guidance. Joe Harless started calling it job aids. Uh, uh, Gloria Geary started calling it electronic performance support systems if it's embedded in electronic devices. Um, nowadays, we call it performance support or workforce learning. We've got a bunch of different names for it. So now I tend to call it job aids for performance guidance and support in the workflow. And I've captured all of the words. Um, right. but, for, but I call it job aids for short, but I used to call it performance aids as well. Um, right. Because oftentimes, the job aid is for more than one job, and it's really uh, should be about performance. But anyway, so I really became indoctrinated into a performance orientation for training or, you know, so I would call it performance-based instruction or performance-based training or performance-based learning. There's too many labels that we use in our field. But uh, so I was oriented to that from the very beginning. Um, and as an example, when we would do our analysis efforts on the front end of projects, we would produce an analysis report. And that analysis report often gave our client, our customers, um, recommendations for solving some of the other issues that we found that we uncovered during our analysis that were not going to be solved uh, by training or instruction. Um, yet we would use that information about the problems that we uncovered. We would include that information in our training so that we could tell the learners, the participants in instruction, what the barriers to performance were, how to avoid them in the first place, and if they were unavoidable, what to do in the second place. And because we focused our analysis with the top performers, what Tom Gilbert called exemplars, um, what I call master performers, um, they have strategies and tactics on how to avoid problems in the first place and what to do if they were unavoidable. And so we would take that content and include that in our instruction. Anyway, that's my story. Wow. Wow, thank you. Thank you. So, wow. I, I must say, Guy, that uh, from the first question, you already mentioned the three, three biggest names in the field. That when you, you're very lucky, as I see it, that when you started your career, you had, okay, number one, I'm staying, I'm staying in my chair, Gary Romler. You had Bob Maker, who just passed away at the age of 98 uh, last week. And, and then you have Peter Pike. <laughs> How lucky you are. I mean, with, uh, uh, at that time, you were like in the, in the 20s only, right? I was uh, 27 when I uh, started uh, that job out of college. Wow. Wow. I doubt uh, how many people in front of the screen tonight uh, have the luck that you had. I mean, when we started, when they started your career. 
I hope I did, but I didn't. <laughs> I know I was I was very very lucky, um, and not only that. After that first job, I was there eighteen months. Then I moved to Motorola, and I was there for eighteen months. And I got a chance to work with Gary Rumler. He was my consultant working on my projects, which meant I carried his pencils as we went from client site to client site. And I learned from him, working with him, attending the meetings, because it was these, these were my projects, but he was the consultant that the organization had hired in to work with me. So I was very lucky. So basically, you're, you, you were telling him what to do? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was very much climbing the learning curve um, and learning from him. And uh, my experience at Motorola was, um, at, you know, so to start off so well working with, you know, people getting influenced by, and we, you know, I would have said Joe Harless as well in that first job. Oh, yeah, that's right. Joe so Harless. There were, there were, cool. there were, I had, I was very, very, very lucky. Um, and then I went to my second job and I got a chance to work on, on a dozen or more projects with Gary Rumler, would go to his offices in New Jersey. He'd come to Chicago, we'd work together on these things. But I also got a chance to work with Neil Rackham, who is the author of Spin Selling. So that's a very famous uh, book uh, regarding selling, consultative selling. And he was one of the consultants that they had brought in as well. And I got a chance to work with him and uh, some of his staff members on win-win uh, negotiations programs and that. So I was I was very lucky to be influenced. And then I was also at Motorola being exposed to the world of total quality management, TQM. So I learned about Deming and Duran and all the big quality gurus. And uh, so my approach to performance improvement is influenced by many people that you would know their names of and they're, you know, many of them are no longer with us. But, right. and, but all these other people and to look at uh, performance well beyond instruction into all the variables that affect performance. And so, I, so my approach and my models that I use are eclectic in that they are from both the human performance technology world or performance improvement and then also from the total quality management movement. Right, right. Wow, that was in the 19, uh, still in the early 1980s, late 70s and uh, yes, early late 80s. late 70s and early 80s. Early 80s. Wow, that really, really, I mean, I mean, the, the name was just going on. I mean, just keep, keep expanding. I, <laughs> Lucky me. <laughs> <laughs> and also, I just, uh, I just uh, uh, said that you just mentioned, uh, was that a uh, new Rackham? Yeah. And uh, because of your uh, video that I, uh, um, I, 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 watched the, I watched this video, uh, spin selling is a very well known in the developing countries in China. And uh, so I'm gonna, he, he's on my list actually. So I'm gonna interview him as well. Oh, excellent. Yes, so, uh, uh, I, yes he was very influential uh, to me and I would, point some of my, I, I became a consultant in 1982 and I used to ask my clients to get to know him and his work and his products, spin selling and win-win and negotiations because of the audiences that I was addressing for my clients overlapped. Right. And I thought there's no need for me to try to recreate what he's already got, just go to him and bring him in. And so he was when I was president of ISPI, he came and was my keynote speaker in 2004. I mean, that we're going to talk about that too. You okay. became the president of ISPI in 2003. We'll come back to that. But right. uh, you really, uh, so you have been in this business for 41 years. That's, that's uh, longer than many of our audiences. <laughs> yeah, I'm a gray beard. <laughs> so can you, if I ask you, if I run into you like in an elevator, I don't know you yet, it's just, if, if I don't know you and then I run into you in, in the elevator, can you give me like a 30 seconds uh, pitch on what is HPT? 
Well, HPT, Human Performance Technology, is the application of science to performance improvement. So it could be also called evidence-based practices for performance improvement. So you need to look at the performance situation, um, which I like to define as performance competence, people performing tasks to produce outputs that both tasks and outputs meet the stakeholder requirements. So there's customers, there's regulators, there's suppliers, there's upper management, there's the employees. There's many, many different kinds of stakeholders. So we need to understand their requirements and meet them when we're performing tasks and producing outputs. So I help my clients understand that. And then I do instruction training and I help them develop their people that are new to the job or you know, training people if the jobs change or if there are regulatory requirements. And I help them avoid training when it's not going to have any impact. Great, but that's more than 30 seconds. I'm just kidding. I'm sorry. <laughs> that's me. Anybody who knows me knows that I cannot do a 30 second spiel in 30 seconds. And I know that too. I'm just <laughs> giving you <our> time. <laughs> But thank you, thank you. That's a very good uh, explanation. I mean, that sum, sums up all the HPT definitions. I would, I would say in plural forms because in, through the years, there's so many definitions of, of human performance technology or performance improvement. By the way, do you see there's a difference between the two terms, a PI and HPT? Um, well, it, the answer is really yes and no. So we are, the field is totally inconsistent with our language. And the late Joe Harless used to complain about this in the mid eighties. And, and I was being exposed to all these new things. And then I'd learned that there's a lot of overlap. So human performance technology or what the old ASTD group now ATD called uh, human performance improvement. Right. That sometimes meant the same thing. Um, but most people come from this from a training or instruction or learning perspective, and right. they, they put those, those blinders on, and that's all they see and look at. That's their solution set. That's what they know. But what I learned from Gary Rumler um, was to, first of all, look at the process. And he, he used to complain, and this is captured on videos that I have up on YouTube, um, that, you know, so oftentimes we train people on things that they already know, and then there would be no difference in the, in the performance workplace. And it was because the, the problem in the, what was never rooted in a deficiency, a deficit of knowledge and skills, there's always something else. And he used to say it's the, either the process or it's the consequence system. We reward poor behavior, we punish good behavior all too often. Um, and that's part of Gilbert's behavior engineering model, the BEM, is that too often we're not, a, we're not systems thinking. We're not looking at it as a system. We're, we're attacking something with our favorite solution set. And so we do our clients a disservice when we uh, attempt, attempt a training intervention and it's not going to have anything uh, to do with solving the problem. But so, the, so the language is an issue. So to me, performance improvement is looking at all of the variables. There's, there's human variables beyond knowledge and skills. There's psychological attributes, there's physical attributes, there's intellectual attributes, and there's personal values. And that's what the human brings to the performance party. And in that performance party, there's a context and there's data and information, materials and supplies, tools and equipment, there's facilities and grounds, there's budget, there's culture, and there's all these other things that the human enters into and either everything is good enough to have a positive impact on the process that produces worthy outputs, to borrow Gilbert's phrase, worthy outputs, um, and worthy performance. Um, and or there's a deficiency someplace. It could be that the data is low. Those are some of the things I learned from the total quality management movement 
there was a tool called the Ishikawa diagram that I saw back in 1981. And it said every process can be decomposed into men, materials, methods, and machines. And when you have a problem in the process, this was a diagnostic tool that people would use to look and see, well, where's the causes? Where's other symptoms or root causes or roots of root causes? Um, and so I learned to think about it that way. And so when people talk about performance improvement, I think most often when I see that out on the social media today, I think most often they're talking about performance-based instruction, not performance improvement. They're coming at it from a training perspective and we got to, you know, instead of talking about topics, we need to talk about tasks and outputs and have a performance orientation. But they, they, Again, that's a partial view of what performance is. So when people use that language, one of the things that one needs to do is ask, so tell me more about that. So that you can decide whether they're talking about, you know, little performance or big performance. Um, the system, the entire, all, everything that it takes to create a process and have a process work well. So it's well beyond knowledge and skills you know, the late W. Edwards Deming, the quality guru said 94% of problems are not due to individuals, it's due to the system. And management is in control of the system. So if that, if that number is true, and he was a statistician, so we, you know, must take him, he must have been close, because Gary Rummler said 80% of the problems are not due right, to the individual. Right. Gary Rummler said 80%. Yeah, and, uh, and Jim Hill, who you probably know, he's got a different number, but it's, it's in between those two. And right. uh, so too often we can be fooled by people and their use of language, of labels, and we have to be wary of that. Um, we have to be careful of the semantics. You know, what do people mean by the language that they're using? And are they truly looking at performance in its broadest sense, or are they looking at it from a training or instructional perspective? Wow, that's, that's a great idea. Thank you. Uh, because I asked about this, the difference between PI and HPT, but you really give us a, the, the whole picture, the whole, you know, uh, holistic, uh, different schools and different thoughts and, you know, different... Uh, to me, that the, whole, the whole notion of human performance technology is not about just the human. The late exactly. Don Tosti, um, who was another guru in ISPI, NSPI, uh, right. he said that all performance is a human endeavor because there was a great debate going on in NSPI and ISPI since I joined in 1979 mm -hmm. as to whether or not we should have the H in HPT or should it just be called PT, performance technology. Right. And so there's a huge debate on that. And, you know, you could have flipped the coin and come up with the right answer because there is no right answer. It's just the answer. So when we when the, the society ISPI nowadays promotes HPT, um, they need to present it as something that's more holistic, more of the systems view more of the all the variables and not just knowledge and skills and not just the human because the human has to work in an environment and you know you can either dig a canal using a shovel or a bulldozer you know and so what tools do we have for the people so that they can do a better job a higher quality job at lower cost um and so it's not just about the human it's a you know, and the human is, you know, always involved. We don't have, you know, lights out factories where robots are doing everything and robots are fixing robots and robots are building robots. We're, we're not there yet. Uh, maybe that happens, you know, um, but, but so we need to, I think, have the broadest view because otherwise we're going to help our clients invest money in the wrong things. And that's no good. Exactly. Exactly. Well, oftentimes uh, you just uh, it's just described uh, describe one of the very uh, very general phenomenon is that uh, a lot of uh, performance improvement efforts are construction based. I mean, still training, 
Like I, if I have hammer and I see everywhere is nails, you know, exactly. <laughs> nails everywhere. Exactly. You know. So if somebody redesigned the process because that was the problem, the process was faulty in the first place. Right. If they did that, then they'd have to train people. So training is sometimes involved in where it's the secondary, part of the secondary solution set. It's not the primary fix or solution. Mm -hmm. But if you change things in the environment, you might have to train people, you know, make them aware through communications or make them educated through, uh, make them knowledgeable through education or make them uh, skillful through training. So sometimes we just need to make people aware that this has changed and based on their, their existing knowledge and skills, they can perform differently. They don't need instruction or training. They just need awareness creating communications. You send them an email and they go, oh, okay, well, we'll do it differently then. And they'll be fine. You bet. What, uh, so you have, you have been in this field for so many years and have seen many uh, school of thought and different, uh, different uh, masters you have worked with closely with the different masters actually in this field. So, uh, and you have been in consulting work with your client for so many years. So my question is, uh, along all these years, uh, what models have you have used and which one is the, you know, the most applicable to your judgment? most value generating and clients are really relying on it. Which one model that you think is more kind of a re recommendable? Um, that's a tough one because I have created my own models because I've stolen. That's fine. Borrowed, that's fine. borrowed the, uh, borrowed from others. So that Ishikawa diagram, I, kind of did a merge of that with Gilbert's behavior engineering model. So I have my own approach to this um, because there, there are models that um, um, help frame your, the data that you need. And that's what I always wanted. I wanted some framework so that I could say, okay, I, can, I need to get this kind of data and I need to get that kind of data. And when I'm done, filling in the cells of my model, then I will have enough data to, to be able to analyze it, assess it, determine where things are deficient, where they're not good enough. And, and that would lead me to solutions. So my answer is the Ishikawa diagram combined with the behavior engineering model are central to the work that I do. But there's other models that I've used to go even deeper. So I, I used what, uh, what Gary Rumler and Tom Gilbert called a performance table. I call it a performance model. Joe Harless called it a job model. And I have a specific configuration for that and the data that goes in there. And um, then Gilbert had a thing called the knowledge map. And I extended that and made it, it's very different. Um, than what he used, but I use that to create my approach to deriving the enabling knowledge and skills. So my first focus is on what's the performance, what's the idea gaps, and then what are the knowledge and skills that are required in order to be able to perform? What do you need to know? And sometimes people know those things because of their education and experience, and sometimes it's they don't know. Right. So can you, uh, can you spell your, uh, your model's name? It's the uh, Epi Fishbone. So it's E-P-P-I Fishbone. Yep. And it, uh, um, it looks like this. I know that. <laughs> I, know, I know that anyway, one because that's So this your is the question. process. And this right. is my definition for performance competence. So that's what we want. We want people to be able to perform tasks, to produce outputs, um, to stakeholder requirements. But so what does that take? So there's environmental enablers on the bottom and there's on the top are the human enablers. So when you say what I want from a process is I've got to look and see, do I have all of the enablers in place or are they deficient? Maybe the culture is bad. And that's causing the problems here. And, and it's got nothing to do with the humans and their values and attributes and, and their knowledge and skills. So that's, that's just my uh, merge thing. And it says someplace on this um, that um, I, it's a, it's, it's a derivative 
of the Ishikawa diagram and the behavior engineering model. Great. Uh, that's I, I know that model because uh, it's uh, it's the same with your on your website and everything. And, I, uh, I have it everywhere. <laughs> right. You have it everywhere. So you have been using the model since when? And uh, how many projects have you done? I mean, uh, done roughly. Uh, but uh, can you give us an, an example of using this IPEC and Fishbone, Fish, uh, IPEC and Fishbone model to do consulting work and gain results? Um, so I, as a consultant, I've been doing instructional systems design work since 1982. 95% of my work is about training or instruction or learning, whatever you want to call it. And some of my work has been outside of that realm. But, um, so, but that model, before it existed in that uh, version, I was using the components of that. So my work has, uh, I've been known for doing what, what's called curriculum architecture design, where we would uh, study a job or a bunch of processes or department, and we would define what the performance is required. And then we would look at what are the enabling knowledge and skills, and then I would architect training and development paths, 20 years later, they were called learning paths, but I've been doing this since, I, I did it at Motorola, in fact, my first curriculum architecture design project. And my, my, my theory about all of this is that there are uh, things that people need to know that are unique to their job and their tasks. And there are other things that they need to know that could be shared with other audiences. And so part of my approach to instruction is that I'm trying to determine what's unique to this job and what's shareable with others. Because if I can build content for the first audience, I may be able to share that content with other audiences and reduce my client's costs for first cost to develop it in the first place or buy it, and then to maintain it over its life cycle. So it's much like a car business where you don't have a different battery for every car. You don't have a different brake system for every car. You don't use a different radio or entertainment system for every car. You have the same radio or music device in every car. You share that. You share the batteries with a lot of cars and you know brake systems. Uh, for very fast cars, you have big brake systems. And for little cars, you have little brake systems. So you don't have just one. You have something that's appropriate to the product. And so, um, one of the things that I, in, when I do my curriculum architecture design or my instructional development, much like an ADDIE model, um, one of the things that I do is that I, I, my analysis involves looking at the target audience. What do we know about the target audience? Who are they? Where are they? What are their incoming knowledge and skills based on experience and education? You know, so what can we safely generalize about what they know and don't know? And here's the variables because I don't want to put people through training if they already know things, but there's some people that don't know those things, so I have to have a modular approach to instruction so that I can get people what they need when they need it. The second thing I do in analysis is look at performance. The third thing is look at the enabling knowledge and skills. And the fourth part of my analysis approach since the early 80s is I look at existing training for reuse purposes. Now, my clients tended to be the bigger companies, the Fortune 500 companies in America. And they would have lots of training content. And I didn't want to rebuild content that they already had. So what the last step in analysis for me before writing up an analysis report and reviewing it with my clients is to figure out, do they already own content that we can use as is or after modification? So if, they, if I needed active listening training content, I could go see, and you know, I had a client at the Norfolk Naval Shipyard that when we got to this stage, we found 27 two-hour modules on active listening. And my client went and reviewed all of those. So he spent you know, 54 hours looking at all these two-hour modules so he could pick the one that we needed. But that, that's an example of what that happens too often. We build content and build content and we don't really pay attention to what do we already have. 
maybe if I took it and just adjusted it a little bit, it would be just fine for us. Maybe I have to take out the examples and change the definitions and change out a demonstration and right. change the practice exercises, and then it would fit. And what I'm doing is then is I'm creating a derivative of that content. Um, and then when, if it ever needs to change, I might have two pieces of content to change, the original and the derivative. Um, but that's still cheaper than continually rebuilding content that you already have. Right. Um, and then a change happens and now you need to update all 27 two hour modules of training. That's ridiculous. So uh, we, I, I, so I approach things much as an engineer might do it. Um, that's worried about life cycle costs and uh, effectiveness of the uh, product. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So how many, uh, can, uh, can we sum it up? Uh, how many steps, uh, like five steps that you go through? Just well, that, so that's, so I, I have a lot of this all detailed. I have a book called Lean ISD that I wrote in 1999. I started in 1983. And I finally finished it. I was busy consultant. I was very, very busy for a, lot, a long time. And I wrote this book. And then in 2007, I decided to make it available as a free PDF. So you can have it as a free PDF. You can buy it as a paperback or a Kindle. And I was doing that so that I could update that book and other books. And I, and I created update versions in 2011. But my, so my Lean ISD book identifies how to do curriculum architecture design, you to develop training and development paths. You don't build any new training. You just figure out what do I need? What do I have? What are the gaps? And of the gaps, what are the high priority ones that we should resource and put in place? And the rest of it, we leave to what's nowadays called informal learning. But I used to call it unstructured OJT. You know, just, just tell them what it is and they'll figure it out. And it's low hanging fruit. It's not a problem. It's not that critical. Um, but we want to focus our, our investments on critical content for critical performance. And so then I have a methodology for doing an addy like uh, an analysis and design and development and pilot testing. And then, and uh, all my methods start with project planning and kickoff. But I have that level. And then I have another level of instructional development where I don't need training. I just need a bunch of job aids. And, or I need... Uh, the equivalent of uh, standard operating procedures, but we don't want to call them that because then regulators will want to look at them. So we'll, we'll call them maybe quick reference guides or job aids. And so that's, you know, we need to build a lot of those. And so I have a process that's quicker. And, you know, you're not going to be building practice with feedback. You're going to be building a bunch of job aids and then getting it out there to the people that need it. And you're not going to put them through instruction in a traditional sense. So I have a methodology for that because one of my clients back in the 80s asked me, you know, what they asked for is they said, can you take the demonstrations in your design and build those first? Because we have a national sales show coming up in three months and we would like to demonstrate on the stage for everybody in the target audience because everybody got together once a year and we want to show them what we're gonna train them to do. So let's do the demonstrations. Can you do those and then come back and build the content and the practice exercises? And I said, sure. <laughs> and then I had to figure out how to do that. Um, so it's like designing a car, knowing that someday you're gonna put a bigger engine in it, but not initially. So how do you build the well that the engine sits in so that it, the bigger engine next year will fit in there so you don't have to redesign the whole car? So that's robust engineering. How do you make things robust to future changes, likely changes, um, and are, do you consider that when you're doing design? Well, you need to do that when you're doing instruction too. You need to look at your instruction and say, I have content that's very, very stable, will never ever change. And then I have other content that's going to change all the time. When? We don't know. Or here's content that we don't, will change every year. So how do I design things to anticipate that? And how do I design for robustness, uh, for use and misuse, for uh, current situation and future situations? And that's a tricky part of design that we don't often think about, but it's been a big deal to me.
and it's what's driven my approach to doing analysis and doing design because I, as a consultant, I wanted to have a lot of repeat business with customers and I do something for them. And then they say, well, you got to come back in two years and, and change this because things have changed. And I wanted to be able to make minor changes to things and not have to blow it up and start all over again. Cause that's, you know, so they liked that they, because they remembered, I told them two years earlier that that's what this would do. So they would put me to the test and say, okay, here's the changes. How do you do that? Well, the concept is kind of plug and play. You take the radio out of the dash that used to be AM, FM, you know, I'm an old guy. And then you put the next one in and it's got a cassette tape player with AM and FM. And then you got to take that one out and put it in with a CD. And now it's going to be, you know, with, with uh, Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. So it can Bluetooth. Yeah, exactly. And so, so, if people knew that that was likely to change that, that entertainment system, I, I worked for the uh, auto companies and uh, when computers started to be put into cars, they had to run the cabling underneath the seats. And later on, they were able to put all the computer components in the dash, behind the dashboard. But initially it was under the driver's seat. Oh my God. Because there was no room behind the dash for anything because they had filled it up. It looked like uh, it's just sitting on an electric chair when you were driving. Yeah, the wiring harnesses that wired everything together had to go underneath the driver's seat. And, you know, then between the carpeting and the metal frame, right. and the, you know, and it, it, so they, they had to quickly redesign so, everything to, to, to anticipate that. So uh, I got a name for that type of, for, for, for your way of doing things. Uh, if I were you, I would name it the modularized, uh, modularized lean learning design or something like that. It, well, exactly. That's, it's all about, so I've been doing modular curriculum designs. Modularization. Of, yeah, uh, and so I have a training and development path and then there's events on there and each event is made up of lessons and each lesson is made up of what I call instructional activities. But it's really just a modular design that any engineering organization building high tech products, right. that's what they do. And so when I would explain it to engineering types and technician types, they understood it and they loved it. When I talked to marketing and salespeople, they said, what is all that? So because when you did that, uh, when you when you did that learning design for the sales organization, and they they need in three months, did they say to you, say, a guy, we need it, in, you know, we need it in three months, and come back later. So we want to to it in the future to be ex uh, replaceable, expendable, leave all the future rooms there. So is so they liked it. So did when they give you the, I mean, later on you build it so agile agile and so uh, lean and so efficient and effective and small cost because you try to maximize your utilization over their existing contents and then pull them in and put in the, the, this kind of order and sequence and modularize in for this purpose and then and then two years later you put it in, in you know sometime later you put into that module and then build into that mode and for, for another purpose so you're trying to modularize. I mean, you're maximizing your usage of the existing content at the same time and see if there's any loopholes or gaps and then you build something new in and then just to make, make it a kind of a closure, you know, just a kind of a collected, collective, uh, collected wisdom uh, of, uh, of the solution. And, but it's quick and easy. But my question is, when they ask you about, when they give you the initial request, did they ask you, we need something new? We need, uh, okay, the three components. We want something quick, low cost, and high quality. Yes, they, so this group was product managers at AT&T, and they were okay. used to a modular approach to systems, telephone systems that are made up of products, which are made up of sub-assemblies, which are made up of components. So they understood how I was talking about these kinds of things. Um, and they were very much concerned about you know, their world was changing because this was the mid 80s and we'd broken up the AT&T monopoly and 
things were going to be changing. They were going to 19, have hazards. Uh, I, I remember it's 1982, AT&T uh, broke up by, uh, was broken up by the Congress. It was called the divestiture. Yes, the, right? uh, the modified divestiture agreement. Uh, but uh, yeah, so that, so it was the Justice Department that said, you're a monopoly right. and we don't want you to be a monopoly anymore. And so it broke them up. The good news for them was that they, their customers, Illinois Bell, New Jersey Bell, all the various Bell operating companies in America, they didn't know how to buy from anybody else. Because it, it used to be that Bell Labs would invent a new technology, Western Electric would build it, and then they would ship it to the operating companies and get it installed. And all of a sudden, the operating companies had choices. They could buy from Northern right. Telecom in Canada. They could buy from AT and T. They could buy from Europe. They could buy from they could buy from anywhere. Right. But they didn't know how to do that. And it, so it took them three, four, five years before they figured out how to actually buy from somebody else. And then you had to worry about the compatibility of technologies and. Right. You know, so, but there's a lot of parallels between the instruction that we build, you know, so what our clients don't need or want is a collection of courses because there's overlaps and gaps in the content. And right. most of the time, it's not focused on performance. It's focused on topics. And the topics are all reasonable sounding. They have face validity but they don't necessarily have performance validity when you look at the content. It doesn't teach you it, it, and you may need that topic in your training, but you need to know how to apply that topic. And that's what's often missing from most training. Because I would you know, do my analysis and then I'd go look at what my clients have. And what we would find over and over and over again is that they have the right topics, but they never teach people how to apply those topics. And so we would have to take what they already had and then we would build in the application content and then they had what they needed. Um, right. The reason I'm asking is uh, nowadays, uh, the practitioners, the learning and development practitioners, or even performance, performance improvement uh, practitioners in China, they're very new, you know, and uh, most of the, and, and you know, Chinese economy is booming, is so fast, and developing so rapidly. So most of the client, not most of them, almost all the clients are asking, can you give me something quick, easy? You know, yes. I, I want my 15 minutes of fame and, 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 you know, something quick and easy and cheap. Well, and that so can be done too. Are you having that too? Uh, in the yeah, so that's, that's, that's not really new. And it's maybe more hyper than it used to be because, you know, there were changes going on back in the late 70s and early 80s. Right. And, there was, you know, so there was a need to keep everything up to date and clients always wanted it, you know, cheaper and better and faster. And so one of the things that uh, I often talk about is how to avoid analysis paralysis. So analysis takes too long and so clients dislike it, they hate it. Um, and they often want you to just, just do it, just design it. No, don't even design, just develop some content and get it out there. Well, there's a time and a place where that is appropriate. There's no time to do the, and that you just get something out there, but right. how you get it out there quickly. So I tend to use master performers and not subject matter experts. I make a distinction between those two okay. types. A okay. master performer was doing a job to a level of mastery just before I met with them. A subject matter expert who knows a lot of all about it may not be able to actually do it. Maybe they did it seven years ago or 10 years ago, but they haven't done it lately. So they don't know what it's like today. Uh, so there's, so I use master performers and what I call other subject matter experts. Maybe they know the new regulations that are coming, but aren't here yet. Well, the master performers don't know about the new regulations coming. They right. know about today's regulations, so I need to combine those two sets of knowledge in my efforts to produce content. So if, if I'm looking at, so people have to perform tasks to produce outputs. Well, I want task-based training that produces outputs. And who knows what those are? Current master performers, and maybe that needs to be influenced by the new regulations coming or the new computer tool that's coming or the new HR policy that we're going to have. 
And so we need to have those kinds of voices in our process. It's what nowadays is called design thinking and agile approaches. These are nothing new. They're just new names for things that are old. And, you know, if people have a need to use the new language, that's fine. But it causes confusion for people coming into the field because they think that's brand new. And it's not. It's, it's you know, what's old is new again. And so working with groups and teams and taking a team approach, th these are quality circles that were used in Japan in the, in the 1950s and 60s. And so they're not... You know, they're, fo they're focused on instruction nowadays, but it's a similar kind of a concept. Um, and, and so there's, you know, there's, there's a lot of ways to do things. There's not right. one right way. There's many, many good models and approaches that are all somewhat similar. And they use different language because Joe Harless used to compete with Gary Rumler. And they uh -huh. called their, the same thing by different language because they were in competition. They were trying to differentiate their brand. You know, both of them told me this. The both of them used to joke about it. Oh, yeah, we stole that from Gary or we stole that from, you know, Bob Mager or he stole it from me. You know, that's what they would say. And then you'd look at them and you go, yeah, these are very similar except for the language and labels that you used. And they go, well, yeah, we had to call it something different. Otherwise, it looked like we stole it. But that's what they did. That's, so I've been encouraged forever to steal or what I would call borrow with attribution. And because Gary Rumble used to say he didn't care who took from him as long as they gave him proper attribution. And so I try to do that. I don't do it perfectly. But everything that I do, I got from somebody else. I, got, I took it from the quality movement or product management at Motorola or AT&T client or instructional yeah. design. All of that comes from other people. Right. Um, so it's, it's important to understand the history, not, not the history, but where did these tools and techniques come from? Because they're not brand new. And there are a lot of things that were lessons right. were learned in using them back in the old days that, that, you know, people don't know. So they're going to make the same mistakes now because we don't learn from history. Right. Right. That's a very important point that uh, you just said. We don't learn from history. We don't learn from our mistakes like human society is. I mean, a little profession like training and performance improvement, we, we, we don't either. And yeah. uh, that's what we call that phenomenon, you know, that was not new and like uh, many years ago existed already. Uh, we, we, got a, we got a very vivid term for that in Chinese. We call it the old bottle, I mean, no, the new bottle with old liquors in it. <laughs> exactly. You know, because uh, just, just the package is different. Yep. So, Anyway, so um, you have seen a lot and uh, you became uh, the president of ISPI in 2003, between 2003 and 2004. And uh, so, and because you, you came into the field in 1979, you've been there for 41 years and uh, long enough. Uh, and then can you tell us what's the challenge before you took office, you know, to the presidency before 2003, and uh, what's the challenge later, and uh, what's the challenge of today? So the challenges with ISPI and the professional society, or is that what you're asking? No, in the field, professionally. In oh, the field. in the field. Not, not the society, not the society. So uh, uh, I've, I've written about this in the last couple of years here, but since 1979, the only thing that's changed is the technology, the tools. Right. computerized tools, miniaturization of tools. Now we have computers in our pockets. Um, and so that has certain affordances, it's utilities that it provides us, like we can send a job aid to your phone and you can follow that and get guidance for performance that way. Uh, before, back in the uh, late 70s and early 80s, the big deal was to laminate your job aid. Why? <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> and and uh, but so so all of that has changed. But the challenges that we face is that there's time pressures, there's cost pressures, there's right. a pressure to just produce something right away, and I resist that. Um, I would tell 
clients that, that uh, you know, I don't want to do that for you because that's my reputation. So if I produce garbage for you, because that's what, you know, you're rushing right. me to do. So either we're going to do something good enough. I'll try to move as quickly as possible. Keep your costs down. But the bottom line measurement is can people perform differently and to the standards that exist. And so we are, we're always faced with people who want to take shortcuts. And sometimes, again, it's appropriate to take a shortcut and get it close enough and then fix it and then fix it again and fix it again and fix it again. So it all depends on what the risks and rewards are for the performance. High stakes performance with high risks and or high rewards needs to be treated differently than things that are not so risky, not so rewarding. And if we're really doing a good job for our clients, we're sh we should only be working on the high stakes performance. We shouldn't be working on, you know, what, what, the phrase is low hanging fruit, the things that are, you know, if, if, it, if it all goes wrong, no big deal. You know, it's a nickel and dime problem, we would say in America. It's not billions of dollars, it's nickels and dimes. Well, why are we even doing that? Leave that to informal learning in the first place. So, so we tend to work on things that have mass audiences. You know, everybody needs active listening. Oh, sure, yeah, we'll create one active listening course and we'll let everybody take that, except it's unlikely to transfer because what, what an engineer in a sales call and the active listening that they do is different than the active listening of a salesperson, is different than the people at the complaint department, the customer services people taking complaints, their active listening is a little bit different. If you're doing it over the phone or virtually versus face-to-face, -face, that's different. And if we don't train people and give them enough knowledge and skills and confidence to be able to do their job, because we often, too often, go to have put people through training where the training is actually seems like it's for somebody else's job, but but we think, oh, it's close enough, so you should be able to learn that, and you'll figure out how to apply it back when you get back to work. Well, then they try it one time, it doesn't work out so well, so they simply give up and they go back to doing it the way they always did it, and so the entire thing was a waste of shareholder equity. Right. And, and good stewards do not waste shareholder equity. Exactly. And you want to do give the, get the highest return for the investments. But sometimes clients want you to just, you know, put, produce something because it's, you know, will make them, you know, add to their stature because they produce a lot of content. Well, if that content doesn't do anything, then it was a total waste. So the return on investment could be negative or nil. Right. Sometimes uh, as a consultant uh, uh, and also, uh, you know, even in content performance or learning development professionals, and uh, we always run into some perplexations or ambigu uh, ambiguous situations. That is, you know, on one hand, I was told like, uh, like Guy Wallace and told me this and, you know, Roger Addison told me this and to do this in that way, to do this that way. The, on the other side is my boss or my client. That's quick, quick, quick. So there are, there, there are two choices. One is to do things that was, it should be done. The other way is the client won't want, want it, you know, the way that client wants it. So have you, have you faced this type of dilemma oh, before? Yes. <laughs> What's oh, your yes. solution? So, so I would tell the client, I said, I, I start off by telling them, I'm going to do exactly what you asked me to do. Then I would say, but I wouldn't do it that way because it's going to fail. And they, and so I want them to know that, yes, I, I say, I will salute you and I will do exactly what you said. It's a big mistake to do it that way though. And then they usually will say, depending on the level of trust that I have, if it's a client that I've worked with before, but if it's a brand new relationship, this is trickier. But I, they might say, well, why do you say that? And I would tell them, and then they can make a business decision as to whether or not to take the risk that we're going to go forward and maybe fail or maybe not. And I said, who knows? I could be wrong and you could be right. But I'll go do exactly what you've asked me to do, and I'll figure out how to do it in the time constraint and the money constraint and whatever. But, but it's a mistake if we skip analysis. You know, if we just jump in and design something and then put it out there, it's probably not going to work. So, but that's the risk. 
but and you're the customer, you know, and I don't believe customer is always right, but you know, he who, uh, he who pays the piper calls the tune, right? Whoever pays the musicians, they get to call out what song that they want. And so you, when you're working with your customers, you got to, and I've had customers um, um, do this on projects where they insisted I do it a certain way. And I said, okay, I will do that. It's going to fail. This is exactly how it's going to fail, but let's get going. And then we would do it and it would fail. And then the big meeting where everybody wants to pin the blame on somebody, I, as the consultant, was taught to do this. I said, stood up and said, it's all my fault. So that we don't have to spend any more time trying to figure out who to blame. I'm the consultant. It's my fault. Whether I'm an internal consultant, because I did this at Motorola. And uh -huh. people in, at Motorola then said, 30 people in the room, they were saying, guy, that's not your fault. You told us it was going to fail. And I said, it's my fault. Let's figure out how to fix it. And they all realized that I was not going to be involved in pinning the blame on any one of them. And they all knew who it was. I knew who it was. But I said, it's my fault. Let's just fix it. Because you were in a hurry to get this done. And now we have to redo it. And now they were more open to they trusted me, so they were more open to listening to what I had to say. And right. I knew that now we're behind schedule, so now we even have greater time pressures. So this is what I think we should do. And I said, I need your top master performers from each of the facilities to come together in one meeting, and we're going to pin this down and create the right content. And they, before they were saying, oh, we can't afford to fly people all over the country. That's ridiculous. Now they said, yes, let's do it. We were des they were desperate. But so I had to build trust with them. And I was taught this. I saw this in the Navy. I was told this when, in my first job out of college, that if anything goes wrong, stand up and take the blame and never take the credit, only take the blame. And if people are saying, that's a great thing you did, guy, you'd, I, you'd have to say, well, actually, it was George. We, we need to credit George and we need to credit, credit Roger Kaufman and Roger Edison and we need to and never take the credit and always take the blame. And that just means as a consultant, internal or external, you are there to serve them. You're not there for the glory. You just want to do a good work for them because that leads to more work for you. And that enhances your reputation. And so as a consultant, yeah. um, external consultant you're trying to you know make the next sale you want repeat sales well that's right. how you get them by doing good work and right. not and not blaming people because if you blamed anybody then they have to worry that oh if something goes wrong in the next project you'll blame them no guy will always take the blame and that's good so we'll shoot the messenger shoot guy and then we'll revive him and get him right back to work again doing the work and so but next to might, might be me, you know, <laughs> right? <laughs> well, yeah. So to, uh, so just to uh, sum up uh, your answer on this question, I mean, that's very key because that's a situation that we run into almost on a daily basis on every project. And so, so we need to, based on what you, did, did you, what you described, we need to professionally really, really profound and know what we're doing, what we're going to do, and we'll know what the right answers are, right? Know what, what they, the thing they should do, but they don't know it. And if I tell them, they still don't, 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 they, they still don't say, no, 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 you're wrong, you're wrong, <laughs> right? So, but we need to know that uh, we, we need to learn uh, from, you know, professional knowledge and all the methodologies. So that's number one. Second, we need to have very good, sharpened, super, communication skills yeah. or, or, or kind of, uh, you know, emotional e, uh, EMI, you know, uh, emotional intelligence, you know, uh, right. I mean, EI, EI. Um, so, yeah. um, so that's very important because doing consulting work more uh, on 50% is, you know, what to do. And second, the, uh, the other 50% is how to do it. Right. The only how part, and what you said is building trust. And uh, one of the very, very, very critical uh, technique is 
blame me, <laughs> blame on me. Yeah. And we had that, we had that in Chinese. Uh, remember if I, uh, when I did my interview with you uh, early April that I said, in our methodology, we have three uh, pr uh, principles. Without this frame principle, you forget about being a manager, forget about being a work for anybody, forget about being a consultant, uh, not to mention. Number one, three, three principles. Number one is convert other people's problem, problems into my problem because I'm paid to do so. I'm paid, that's, that's my fault. Uh, this is my, my responsibility. Oh, that thing happened. I didn't do my job. That's me. I don't care about you. I mean, that because I didn't do it. That's why it happened. I don't care anybody. You know, that manager, that supervisor, it's my fault. Same thing. I think we were thinking the same, and that's a great advice. Thank you, sir. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah, that's that. That's really that's really great. And then you just mentioned that uh, small pockets and computers, and nowadays, like we can. Oh, I can send a job aid on your smartphone. But in the old days, like we use like credit card, we have to really design and fine print it and cut into like credit card size and fit into our wallet, right? Exactly. Exactly. I did that. Remember when you when we mentioned the uh, Bell companies? I used to work for U.S. West. I worked for U.S. West a couple of years in in the in, in states, and I was in Minneapolis. So anyway, so that really that really works. And uh, but speaking of speaking of my interview with you, so you were you have been doing the HPT videos. Yes, the HPT videos, the one and only. I haven't seen anything like that in this field or in any other field. I mean, in other fields, they, you know, in MBA, they might have it and they, they have a huge database, but they're big, they're funded, they're huge. I mean, they, they, they're, they're, they're suspectedly doing it. But in our field, you are doing it this on your own. You have been doing this for many years and tell us how many years have you done? I know I am 120, you know, number 120 that you told me if I'm, I'm correct. And then, how did you select those guests and how did you do it and why did you do it and what's the occasion why did when did you start and what what were what the most the biggest challenges because what i'm doing now the training master series is more likely a mimic mimic version mini mini mimic mimicking version of what you you have done with the hpd videos well, the, the genesis, the start of all of that was that I felt that ISPI was doing a poor job of marketing what the heck HPT was and is and could be. And again, they use different language. You can look on the website, you can look in the articles, you can look in the journals. We call it performance improvement. We call it performance technology. We call it human performance technology. We call it human performance improvement. We call it HR. We call it this, we call it that. It's a mess. And I thought, well, you know, they, the marketing has got to be more than telling people something one time. Right. Well, we told them. Well, wait a minute. They hear three you told them different versions. Today. Yeah. Right. So I thought, okay, so what I want to do is I wanted to start a series mm -hmm. of videos. I'll go, I'll do, and I was doing this at the conference. So in 2008, like the I, series. Took my, I took my, uh, my tripod and my little phone, a little camera, not a phone camera, but a little, a little camera that did, would do videos and I set that up and I, and I had a piece of paper that I hung on the front of the camera that had all the questions and there were seven questions and people just looked into the camera, looked at that and answered them. My, my voice wasn't there. And so I, I happened, I, I asked Gary Rumler, I said, Gary, will you do one of these videos with me? And he said, well, let me see your questions here. And he said, Okay, uh, not, I'm not going to do it now, but I'll do it tomorrow with you after my session, and let me study your questions here. So he came the next day, and he had written two pages of notes because he wanted to answer the questions because he was taking it seriously. So I sat with him. We did an eight-minute video. I think I did 12 or 14 videos that first conference in 2008 in New York City. Um, and I asked Gary afterwards, I said, you know, I'd like to sit down with you for two hours next year and do a longer interview and go really in depth. And he said, yes, he would do that with me. And then he passed away in between. 
And he passed so, away in 2009 2000, or 2010. Yeah, he passed away in 2009, uh, 2008, in October of 2008. Oh, okay. Okay. And, um, and so when the conference came around the next April, he wasn't there. And I, th I thought, boy, I better get these people before they die. And so the first series I was calling the HPT Practitioner Series, short little videos, and the fir very first one I did was with Joe Harless. I went to his house in the suburbs of Atlanta and I drove five hours to go get there and, and interviewed him. And the next year I said to Joe, I said, I'd like to come back and do it again. And he said, oh really? I said, yeah, I'd like to do a short one and a long one. Because I wanted to model for people. Here's the short one, answer the seven questions, be quick about it. And then, Joe, let's sit out here in the corner of your rec room, your, where your pool table is, and we'll sit there and we'll, we'll do an interview and we'll go 45 minutes to an hour. And uh, he and I did that. And uh, he said, are you trying to capture the old guys before we die? And I said, Shh, yes. So I started doing the two series, HPT Practitioner and then the HPT Legacy series. Okay. And the legacy ones are much longer. And I would, people say, well, how you know, short do you want to make this? And I go, I, we could go four or five hours. I don't care. Because right. I don't care what the audience wants short videos, because I don't care. I want to capture you. I want to get everything that I can from you, all your wisdom and insight that I can extract from you on a video interview. I want that for, long, for, the, for all time. I don't want that because somebody wants something quick. You know, right. they can they can have somebody tell them to look at this minute and that minute and that minute. Ah, but I want to capture the your story, your background, your philosophies, what you see is good and bad about the practices today. And so then I did those and I would go to conferences and spend all the money to go to a conference and I wouldn't attend any sessions because I was doing videos. And I did that five years in a row. And I decided, okay, I, and then I got a big project for 14 months in Toronto and I was gone and I missed a conference, two conferences because of that big project. And I decided, okay, so I'm going to have to invest in the software. I'm gonna start doing these things over the internet, over Skype or Zoom. And I'm going to start doing the interviews that way. And so I kind of, after a few years of not doing the videos, I started doing them. And I wanted to get people that were from ISPI and NSPI. And I wanted to do, and I quit doing the two versions. I just do a long video as long as it takes. Some of them are, you know, 13 minutes long and some of them go an hour and 10 minutes. Um, and I don't care. It's, it, if people have something interesting to say, I want to capture it. I'm not worried about fitting it into a, you know, the two hour module or the two minute module or a five minute video. I, I really don't care about that. Someday somebody can edit them down and boil them down to something more succinct, but that's not my purpose. So, not, so I've got 120 videos and I've stopped doing it because of internet connectivity issues. I'm in the mountains of North Carolina and I don't have stellar great you know, internet connections. It fails often. And so I stopped doing them because it just takes too long to edit those and make all the fixes to them. Uh, I will start them up again here soon. Um, but so my intent is to capture the diversity of HPT practitioners and the diversity of their HPT practices because HPT is something very broad. So if somebody is working on Six Sigma and Lean, that's HPT. Because many people don't know this, but when Motorola created Six Sigma back in the mid 60s, they licensed the intellectual property of Gary Rumler to do it. So Six Sigma is based on all the total quality management tools and techniques and the process orientation of Gary A. Rumler, now deceased. He was my one of my key mentors, my, my key mentor. I've got a lot of mentors. But um, so, so he, and if you look at Gary's work and a lot of his writings at the at end of his life, it's all about lean. It's not about Six Sigma, it's about lean. Streamlining processes, stripping out time and tasks, shortening the cycle time, reducing costs significantly. And that's what he was doing. And that's, instruction is not got a lot to do with that. 
but there are people who do training, learning, instruction, and they are part of HPT. And so it's like having plumbers and electricians and people who you know pour the foundation and carpenters who build your house and roofers. It takes a lot of people. And what, what the challenge is for those of us who are trying to do performance improvement, but we come at it from one discipline or another, instruction or Six Sigma, Lean and whatever, a motivation, you know, there's a lot of variables that we need to attend to. But what I think one of the challenges for all of us is to learn how to conduct analysis to figure out where the deficiencies are and have a collaborative process to do that and a collaborative process to do the fixes. And where if we were training people, figuring out, well, here's the problems, and some of them are based on knowledge and skills, but others aren't, I may have to turn over that effort to somebody else and let them take the lead and make the fix. And maybe training will be a component of that fix when they redesign the process or put in new tools, but putting this redesigning the process and putting in the new tools is not something that they're going to give an instructional designer to do. And so I, I've tried with my, all of my methodologies to be using language borrowed from elsewhere and models and imagery that, that other people might be able to relate to because it comes from their world. That's where I stole it or borrowed it from. And, and talk in, in language that isn't so instructional or HPT-ish, it's gotta be more universal. It's gotta relate to engineers who are doing design of experiments to figure out whether this process and these materials work better than these other 10 versions. And, uh, but, but, but anyway, so that's, I think our challenge is that, you know, we're not going to be as instructional design people, we're not gonna be in charge of all of the fixes, but we can contribute to our clients' success by uncovering things and helping them to see it, and then let, uh, working with them as they bring in the other people with other skill sets and knowledge to make the, the improvement. Um, well, uh, you you just mentioned, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, you just mentioned a couple of times that performance analysis, uh, front, an front end analysis is, is uh, very important. You mentioned a couple of times. Uh, normally, how, how, did, how did you do it and um, uh, how long does it take normally compared to the, if the project is like, like 14 months and you just said that big project in Toronto and then- Well, that, that project was fix fixing SOPs in, for a pharma company that had been- okay. in but Normally, so, so I, when I do analysis and design, I use what I call a facilitated group process. And I've been doing this since 1979. And as a consultant, I've been doing this since 1982, where I tell my client, okay, we need to do analysis, we need to do design. And they, you know, would agree to that. I say, I can do the analysis in three days if you bring all the master performers from all the right places in the organization. If you are in the United States and you've got seven regions and seven regional vice presidents, I say the smart thing is to bring in somebody, the best person from each of those regions. And the smartest thing to do is to ask that regional vice president who they would nominate to come so that we, they have the best representation so we give them back training that is really performance oriented and all of this. So, but I can do that in three days, but if you don't bring everybody together, it's gonna to take three weeks or three months because I'm gonna to have to do individual interviews, observations, document reviews, or I can bring the right people together, master performers and other subject matter experts, and in three days I can facilitate them to produce all the data that it would have taken three weeks or three months otherwise. And they go, oh, okay, okay. so there's a trade-off there of, Flying people in, increasing that cost, but decreasing guys' costs from three months to three days, well, that, you know, it's a math problem. So, and I'll do design the same way. I'll say, take those same master performers and take the analysis data that they generated and work with them to create a design. So I've got the voice of the customer, the voice of master performers influencing the, the analysis data and then also the design. Because when I do design and I say, 
well, I need to teach people A, B, and C. And they might say, well, half the audience already knows B. And I said, but then the other half doesn't know B. So we have to modulize our content. We'll have a module on A, a module on B that some people will take and other people will skip, and then they'll go to module C. Does that make sense? And they say, actually, you need to break A in, into two pieces or three pieces as well. So I get the, the, the people who know to help me with the design. And I used to tell them, you know, we're not designing by committee. You're influencing me, the designer, by committee. So I need you. So if I say, hey, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that, what do you think? And they go, oh, no, wrong. Here, do it this way instead. And I, then I would do and, and do what I call face polling. I'd look at everybody in the eyes and I'd say, do you agree? Do you agree? Do you agree? Do you agree? And if they all agree, it's a winner. Done. Move on to the next tasks and let them help me design things. And when they say, oh, they don't need practice on that, and I would, I can challenge them and say, well, wait a minute, you told me this was a critical step and it's really complex and tricky and you're going to just tell them and then we're not going to have any practice. How does that work? And they might say, oh, well, you're right. Well, we need practice. Um, thank you. Thank you, Guy. Uh, next question is, what do you think the current pandemic will impact our field, the field of performance improvement? What's your take on that? Yes, I think that there will be an impact. Mm -hmm. And of course, we can't meet face to face and make that more social connection. Um, and we're going to have to do things virtually, you know, but we, but I've been, I've used to doing things on conference calls or phone calls. And, and uh, so I, I think th the challenge will be our clients are going to be in a bigger hurry to produce more at, at a cheaper rate. And I think that, that that can, you know, hurt our efforts. So clients don't like analysis because it takes too long and it doesn't really add a lot of value. That's a fault of our profession. We, we have poor practices. We don't know how to do it well and to do it quickly. And that's something that people need to learn how to do analysis and really pin it down. Um, yet, so, and, and so they'll be in a hurry and they'll say, well, just talk to this person and talk to that person. But one of the things that the research shows us, and I was given all of this by Dr. Richard E. Clark, Dick Clark, is that... Um, oh, yeah, Dick Clark. Yeah, so, so, you know, if you ask a subject matter expert or actually anybody, every, everybody operates mostly on non-conscious knowledge. You, me, all the people here uh, listening in. So if you ask us, we will give you our answer. But what the research shows is that I will be missing up to 70% of what a novice needs. So our reliance on talking to one subject matter expert and letting them guide the development process and giving us all the content is faulty because they're, they're gonna miss the nuance, the, the detailed steps because it, they've automated that. And so they just do it and they don't even think about it anymore. So they can't tell you about it. And so that means two things. When we do our work, we have to talk to more people and, and have them fill in the gaps because the good news Dr. Richard Clark told me was that the good news is, is that they, they know a different 30% and they'll miss a different 70%. So if you talk to enough people here, you'll get close to 85% of what you need. It's still not perfect. Um, which then goes to what Bob Mager taught all of us going back way before I got into the business and that is to test, to test your product to do what, what's called, in some circles, I was always taught it was alpha testing and beta testing and then a pilot test. And the alpha testing is when you talk to somebody who sits nearby you. We don't do that in the virtual world, but hey, can you look at this and see if it makes any sense? And you might do that for me, but you don't know the content. You don't know if that's accurate and complete, but at least the grammar looks right and the punctuation is okay. But then I need to go to somebody else and do the beta test and have somebody look at it that knows a lot more about it. And then they can judge it, but then they're operating on non-conscious knowledge. 
And then I would need, so what I started doing is that I separate out pilot testing from my development phase in my model because I want to make okay. a big deal about it. And I would tell my client, I intend to do a full destructive test. If this training can be broken, I'm going to break it. And you have to help me. And they go, well, we, we don't want to break it. I said, you want to break it now before you send it out to the field and everybody's using it. And then they decide it's no good. So let's break it as soon as we can and fix it as soon as we can and get it out there. And they go, okay, well, that does make some sense. And I say, so I need two kinds of audiences. I, got, I want to measure whether learning occurs. So I need the real target audience because most of the time when I would do training and development and do a test of it, they'd send in all the top people to take a look at this to make sure it was okay. And you could never measure learning. People at the end of it would say, well, I didn't learn a darn thing. And I found some of your errors. So I said, I want two audiences. I want the target audience so I can measure learning with them. I can measure their learning, what they know before they come in, and I can measure their learning after it. And my, when I talk about measuring learning, it's the ability to perform, not a knowledge and skill test, not multiple choice, not fill in the blank. It's actually do the work. Do what? You know, you got to write a uh, proposal, then that's the test. Write a proposal. If you've got to make a weld, then that's the test, not a knowledge test about welding, but a real weld test. But I also then for my second audience, I need master performers and other subject matter experts. And they can tell me if what was learned was accurate, complete, and appropriate. The learner target audience can't tell me any of that. They don't know if it's accurate or complete or appropriate. They don't know, but I can measure learning with them. And then if I have the right people, they can measure, they can tell me about accuracy, completeness, and appropriateness. But again, they're operating on non-conscious knowledge, so they could miss something too because it was not in the course, and they've automated it, so they're not thinking about it. So they're just assuming that somebody would do it right, you know, without thinking about it too hard. So that right. becomes tricky. So you need the, the right mix of people, and I would always tell my clients. Do you have people that hate training? Yeah, well, that's who I want in the room. I want people who hate training. They're there to attack it. They're there to find every missing thing. And they said, oh, you're really serious about this full destructive test. I go, yes, sir, I am. Yes, ma'am, I am. Let's break it. If there's something missing or wrong, let's find it as soon as possible. Let's break the thing. And because I had really clients who tell me that, you know, pilot testing is just an excuse for having a bad training thing. And I would say, well, my goal is less than 10% revisions. Mm -hmm. And, but if we don't do this testing, we could put something out there that's, that leads to pro more problems, more rework, more scrap, injuries or death. We don't want that. So let's, let's test it. And so Bob Mager used to make a big, big deal about testing our instructional products before they were being used. And so the, the pandemic is going to inhibit the client's willingness to do analysis correctly and do the testing correctly. And it's trickier when depending, you know, many things can be done virtually and that's not a big deal. I think that, you know, we, some of us are afraid of that because we haven't done a lot of that. And we don't know a lot about it and it's scary. We may be competent with, you know, face-to-face -face training or whatever, or e-learning, but this virtual stuff is, you know, that's scary, and I don't want to be incompetent, you know, because I'm just learning. So that's scary for people. But we right. need to reduce the fear, but we need to really make sure that what we're producing is worth it, and, even, and testing it will help us fix whatever problems there are, and it won't be perfect. It will go out there imperfect. And we'll have to do right. maintenance on it over the over the life cycle. Um, right. So it depends on you know if it's a life and death situation that we may want to test it and test it and test it and fix it oh, and yeah, test yeah. it and fix it and test it and then put it out there. But otherwise, if it's not that critical, that life or death kind of a situation, we may be willing to put it out there. And those are business decisions. So they're in a ISD project in a training development project. There are lots of business decisions that you and I have no business making. The clients need to make those decisions because of their business decisions and they live with the consequences of those decisions. Um, and so we need to find ways to partner. But, but this whole pandemic has, has put a layer 
uh, on top of us, more constraints, and we're going to have to figure out how to do our work high quality, low cost, faster, given all these constraints. And 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 so I, I you know, and so some of our clients may be more uh, willing to take a risk to be to get something done sooner, and we need to be able to do that. We we can do like we talked about earlier. We can say yes, I will do that exactly as you have said. I'll hit that deadline. Here's the problems that I see, though. So help me figure out how we're going to minimize or eliminate those problems, because otherwise I'm going to do just what you've asked, and we could end up with a bad product. And, you know, you have to decide whether that's worth it or what we can do. And we can't go for perfection. And because there is no such thing. Um, right. You know, the quality movement teaches, you know, there's, there's no such thing as zero defects. <laughs> there's no such thing. There's no such right. thing. So, so how do you minimize it? How do you get it to six sigma or three sigma or one sigma? You know, what's right. the tolerance? Right. Okay. Uh, last question. What's your advice? Well, I have another one, but uh, what's your advice to the young pr practitioners out there? So if they are in the training business, because yours is the training yeah. master series, so they need to focus on the authentic performance that's required out on the job. If you always think about, well, back on the job, people have to do things and they have a certain environment that they have to do that. It could be inside a building, where it's air conditioned and controlled, or it could be out in a thunderstorm, where is the performance taking place? And, and so I've got to make sure that that's what I'm building is, is uh, instruction, job aids that stand alone, job aids that are embedded in training, or training because we need people to memorize things and or have honed perfect, you know, better skills. Whatever I'm creating, it's got to have that positive impact. It's got to influence the performance out there and and so I've got to be focused on performance, performance, performance. It's not about instruction. It's not about content. It's not about context. It's about performance. And that's got right. to be the ultimate measure of what you're doing. Right. Right. Thank you. Thank you. So really bear, in, bear, bear with uh, and in mind. Yes, exactly. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And uh, last question is, uh, if I can, additional. Uh, the question is, if you had a chance to start all over again, like, I mean, look at, looking back at your 41 years of uh, professional development, what would you have done differently? You know, I have been so lucky that it's, that uh, I, it's hard. I've been asked this question before and, and so, and okay. fairly recently. And, um, I would have probably looked to see, to get more familiar with the actual research. I'm not a researcher. I can't mm -hmm. cite the research, but I do believe I know what the research tells me to do, but I don't mm -hmm. always know why. And so I don't ever quote research. I seldom do. I was talking about Richard Clark and what I learned from him, but I can't cite that research and exactly where that came from. I have been a sponge. I've absorbed things from people and gone off and done it. And I don't know, I think I've been so lucky in all of my jobs and the people that I work with and the influences that I've had. Right. Um, I, I, if, if there was anything that I would have changed, I, I probably would have wanted to spend more time working with some of the people that influenced me, but I didn't get to work with them. So I got to work with Gary Rummer, but I didn't get to work with Joe Harless and I didn't get to work with Bob Maker. And I wish that I would have had that opportunity. But you can't get those opportunities. So I think for others, you know, if they were to say, well, you know, guy wish he would have done this guy wishes that he would have looked at the, um, the, the people who were really practicing performance improvement beyond instruction and, and known about that would have looked beyond. I wish I knew more about motivation and motivation theory I wish I would know more about culture and what some of the uh, experts were about system four thinking uh, liquor and uh, you know, but, but I got exposed to some of those things by Bill Daniels at I NSPI. And so I, 
So I've, but I could have done more to go explore the, the source materials, the source research, and I didn't do that. But on the other hand, I, I'm, I'm fine with being a practitioner who has stolen from the best <laughs> and, and put that into my own practice. Um, I don't know. So I can't, you know, I can't say because it would sound like I'm complaining about, oh, I yeah. wish I would have done this. Or I wish I've done that. I can't, I can't come up with much. I think, I think it's more kind of an advice to the younger practitioners. I mean, looking in retrospect, what you have done and what you probably have missed and you, you, you know, you have had that opportunity. I mean, other to other younger practitioners out yeah. there and um, you know, if they run, they run into your situation, they have that option and uh, what they would do, you know, that's kind of also advice to them as well. So I, what I'd, do you say, think? I'd say find a good professional network to join yeah. And, and, and read, you know, if this book, I, I would buy this book. This, I, this is probably about the 10th version of this book that I've bought because they right. tended to walk out of my office in the middle of the night and disappear. And, but I would give this book to clients and say, well, this is really what it's all about. We used to give out the book human competence by Tom Gilbert, but that's a difficult yeah. read. This was much easier for clients to just look at and they'd get hooked on it right away. And, um, but, you know, get a good professional network and, and, and determine whether or not the people in your professional network are following the science or whether they, you know, there's a lot of myths that we need to avoid. And there's people who talk about these myths and you need to avoid them. Um, right. There's professional organizations, professional societies that, that promote myths as well. And right. you need to be careful and wary about them. Right, right. What do you think? Uh, you, have, you have made so many uh, series, uh, HPT videos included. Uh, what do you think really make a master in our field? Like Joe Hollis, like Gary Rambler, like I think it was the focus on results. Okay. They didn't look at you know, they're, 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 it used to be called research-based and results-oriented. And, you know, so Tom Gilbert talked about avoiding the cult of behaviors. You know, people try to train people on new behaviors. But if they're not really clear on what the terminal results are, then the behaviors are either appropriate or not appropriate. But you know, So we can't be training people on activities and behaviors. Our focus cannot be on that. We cannot right. be measuring our success by activities. It's got to be about the terminal results. So having that focus on results, that's the big takeaway I got from all those NSPI, ISPIers back uh, in the late 70s and early 80s. Yeah. Um, Without results, all those behaviors or actions and they're baseless or they're exactly. clueless. Clueless. Yeah. 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 Wow. I must take a big breath. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, sir. I, uh, my, uh, my head off. And this is a, like really, really a whole range of knowledges and that you just presented to us. And thank you. Thank you. I'm just a parrot. <laughs> a parrot You're parroting not. all the things that I've learned from people. And I hope that I've done them well and not uh, misconstrued and miscommunicated things, which could happen. But, um, yeah, we're all standing on the shoulders of giants and I just was very lucky to do that. So find yourself, your local giants, find people close to you that can help and mentor you. And as the late Gary Rumler told me back in 1999, when I asked him how I could ever repay him, he said, you can't. And then he waited a few seconds and then he said, you're gonna have to do what I had to do and that is pay it forward. I could never repay my mentors. So guy, you need to pay it forward. And that's, so that's what I've been trying to do in honor of all the things that he and many, many others did for me. Right. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And uh, I hope uh, that we'll, we'll have another opportunity to have you back again sometime soon. I'd be happy to do so. You bet. You bet. And stay safe.